So I think I think we are online now. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Jeff Hangout tonight on Ukraine, current challenges, future challenges, and the Dutch referendum coming up. A lot to discuss tonight, and I have three speakers here with me, who is Katja Kruk from Ukraine, who was um, present from the very beginning on Euromaidan and reporting from Euromaidan on Twitter, um, providing many people all across the globe with uh, live updates from Euromaidan. I was one of the people following, as probably many of you today, and um, so it's, I guess, very interesting to hear what Katya thinks looking back at this time and looking at current challenges. Our second guest is Jonas, who um, will look at the um, issue from a more academic perspective, perhaps. He's studying or doing a PhD at the European University Institute in Florence and is focusing on EU and Russian security policy and uh, the reasons of conflict in Eastern Europe. And then we have Tom from Jeff Netherlands who is going to speak about the current situation in the Netherlands and the upcoming referendum. You will also be able to ask questions to our um, panelists for this, please go on our Facebook page, where you have just selected the link to follow this debate, and write your questions there, and I will then ask these questions to the participants today. In terms of um, sort of the agenda that we want to go through in this um, hour ahead, um, we would like to talk a bit about the background of the conflict and, um, and the events that preceded. Um, on, on Euromaidan, and then to talk about to then talk about the current challenges, um, domestic and international for Ukraine, and the role of the EU in this, and we'll then have a look on um, the referendum in the Netherlands and what this all means for the transition in Ukraine and for Europe's role in um, in this. To start off, I will ask Jonas um, to give us a, a brief overview on um, the causes of the um, of the conflict and how this how this whole uh, events were were started. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everybody. Um, from my side, um, hello to all of you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing that you are debating this to find the best uh, position that the young European federalists could take on this. Now, um, if we are asking about the causes of this conflict, um, we are, of course, faced with a very complex um, scenario, and I will try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, if, we, if I were to summarize it in one sentence, I would say the conflict in Ukraine happened um, because three different actors with very different perceptions and interests clashed, not necessarily um, because they were malevolent, malevolent towards each other, but um, because they had their own agendas, they misperceived certain things, they pursued other goals, and then um, there was a clash. Now, these three actors um, that are uh, important here are, of course, the European Union, um, although the member states play a distinct role here as well, Russia, and, uh, of course, Ukraine itself. Now, um, we are talking now about this um, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement as if it was something new, but the negotiations for that had started already in 2012. And it's important to notice that here, against this popular version that sometimes claims that the EU aggressively pushed forward to integrate Ukraine, um, it was more the Ukrainians that have been for a long time pushing for something like that. Um, I can elaborate on that a little bit later as well. Now, in 2012, these negotiations start. And for Ukraine, that is an important point because there is political turmoil in the country. There are a lot of economic problems as well. And Ukraine had just gotten barely out of an economic crisis and another clash with Russia where um, there was another crisis with gas where Ukraine had just ceded um, more stationing rights for Russia on Crimea um, and where it seemed like there was a moment of tranquility. Now in Russia, um, the situation was even more different and more difficult. Um, Putin had um, some years earlier 
um, crack down on um, popular demonstrations on Bolotnaya Square. Um, the economic situation in Russia um, was deterior deteriorating um, already back then. That mainly relates to oil prices. And um, a question that has been very pertinent to Russia became even more important, namely the question how to relate to its near abroad, as they usually call it in the Kremlin. Now, um, Russia reacted towards the um, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement quite strongly by um, fostering Eurasian integration, as they call it. This is an old scheme. Um, Russia has been trying to do this for a long time. It looks suspiciously like the EU, but there are, uh, in comparison to the EU, more geopolitical rather than economic um, factors at work. I'm willing to elaborate on that if somebody wants to know. Um, however, suffice it to say now that immediately after these talks took off between the EU and Ukraine, Russia intensified its own efforts um, and used a combination of pressure and inducements. So there were economic embargoes that were um, quite severe. Um, the, Russia complicated the energy relations between Russia and Ukraine, which are quite important because Ukraine relies a lot on the import of gas from Russia, its economy is very dependent on that, and as well on um, the fees that they get for transiting gas towards Europe, um, which is a very, very um, big volume. Now, um, the, the Ukrainians um, under Yanukovych nonetheless um, started to make the deal with um, the EU and were not really giving in into Russian pressure um, and inducement, but then all of a sudden the situation was reversed. And um, there's a lot of inside talk that um, Putin directly threatened um, Yanukovych um, in combination with um, all these other measurements that I have just mentioned. So the deal was all of a sudden revoked at that time. I um, worked at a, um, for a German member of parliament and nobody uh, saw it coming. I can um, confirm that from first hand, it was um, quite, a, um, quite a surprise to everybody. Now, Ukraine got out of the deal under Yanukovych, and that immediately later agreed on a large package with Russia, loans, energy discounts, and the sanctions of Russia were ended. Um, but it was clear that Russia re retained the possibility to reapply pressure. Now, the Ukrainians didn't take lightly to that, because they saw that this was not in their own best interest. Um, this is a strong impetus for fighting corruption and integrating into a European framework, on which I can elaborate later. Now, the Maidan protests um, sparked a clash between the regime on the one hand and the protesters on the other. Um, there was this horrible massacres um, where so many people were shot and the whole conflict escalated, which finally um, led to Yanukovych um, fleeing, fleeing into Russia and then to a whole host of Russian actions that have been hitherto unseen uh, in European politics for decades, if we don't count um, the Balkan wars. Namely, Russia annexed Crimea, um, which is a military action um, and something that is quite unique in the, in the 21st century as we know it. Um, furthermore, Russia heavily supported um, separatism in, Eastern, in the eastern of Ukraine. It applied a trade embargo. It massively raised the price of tax uh, of gas. Um, it revoked um, several loans that it had made to Ukraine. Um, it did everything in its power to destabilize the country at this moment. Now, um, the, the reactions were mixed. Um, there was fighting in eastern Ukraine. There was a danger of immediate interstate war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, newer sources say that from the West, it was suggested to Ukraine to not take offensive action, because then um, the West might not come to its aid. But that is something where the sources start to become unreliable. Now, the fighting continued, and so did the sanctions that Russia applied. Um, there were several... Um, contracts that were made, the so-called Minsk Agreement, um, on the one hand, um, and at the same time, the EU postponed the DCFTA that it had originally concluded with the Ukrainians. So this is basically where we are now. The agreement is 
technically in force, it is applied, but this whole thing is still in movement. And um, this is what I understand what the um, Dutch referendum is also about. Furthermore, we have another agreement. Um, it's called Minsk II. And in that agreement are um, several provisions that I think are enlightening when it comes to Russian goals, on which we can talk a little bit more later. Um, to just summarize it, and then I will uh, cede the microphone. Um, in the Minsk agreement, um, it is said that the eastern provinces of um, Ukraine should have um, more autonomy, which is a notoriously vague term. From what I understand is that on the side of the Russians, who were always very eager to force the Kievan government to accept these separatist republics at the negotiation table, that the Russians were pushing for um, a veto right of the eastern provinces on foreign policy decisions. And this is important to understand because from what we are getting from the Kremlin um, and what I find a very plausible thesis is that Russia is concerned about its immediate influence in this very important neighboring country. And the two most important things that are to consider here is the possibility of EU membership, on which we should definitely debate, and um, even more so the um, possibility of a NATO membership. Just to recall, the only other country that Russia has officially fought since the end of the Cold War is um, Georgia, and this war happened right in the aftermath of major steps that were taken towards NATO membership, and NATO membership was an aspiration of, I would say, um, a strategic political majority uh, within Ukraine. All these factors matter. Um, maybe we can elaborate on them a little bit more later. Please. Well, thank you very much, Jonas. Uh, I would like to ask uh, you, Katya, um, you, were, you were present in Kiev in, in these days. Perhaps you can tell us from a, from a Kiev perspective, what made people go out on the streets in late 2013? First of all, I would like to thank very much to Jonas, obviously, for this introduction and to bring in together a lot of very complicated issues. But now I would like to give the insight of how it was um, looking like in Ukraine. And when we're looking at politics on this very high level of uh, relations between countries of global powers, of regional superpowers, and we don't see people over there. We see interests of the countries and we see how they interact. And Euromaidan is very beautiful and very inspiring case, maybe for a lot of countries uh, a little bit dangerous because this is a clear example of how people and their perception of the country and its future is taking lead and how people and not politicians, obviously even those who, who were elected, uh, try to shape country and try to bring it in the, in the right or wrong direction, it depends. Um, obviously, I would, from time to time, since Jonas was the first one and it has brought a lot of different issues, uh, I would, like, we'll take some, some things that he said and we'll elaborate or maybe we'll provide this Ukrainian perspective. So first of all, uh, you, Jonas, said that uh, for many people in Western Europe it was a huge surprise that Yanukovych actually didn't sign the association agreement and it's absolutely true. It was confirmed by every single politician I ever met in Brussels, in European capitals, also in America. Um, surprisingly, only those very anti-Russian ones, uh, especially from the Eastern Europe, those who know um, how the relations and how the events look like in the Eastern Europe, they were saying that no, that Russia might bring too much pressure on Ukraine and obviously on Yanukovych not to sign. Um, it wasn't that much of a surprise for us Ukrainians because when you look on the domestic politi policies of Yanukovych and of his government, he was everything that European Union is not. So the very person and his regime was so much far away from European standards, from European values, uh, from everything which is declared European and what we see in European countries, in member states, that it was a huge surprise and I remember very well that the spokesperson of the um, party of regions in the parliament, uh, Anna Herman, uh, she was repeating very often, actually she was finishing every her statement with this one sentence that, look, after your orange revolution, your, let's say so, post-orange revolution parties, you didn't manage to bring Ukraine to Europe and this is President Yanukovych who will bring Ukraine to Europe. 
So for almost a year and a half, uh, when, it when it became obvious that Ukraine will make this association agreement, will finalize the negotiations, and obviously DCFTA was the biggest part, the economics part, it's about 80%, I would say so, of the whole association agreement. So it was the main message of the party of regions, of the ruling party of the government. And that is why this is the biggest reason why people reacted with such a surprise when suddenly there was one sentence from the Prime Minister back then, Mikola Azarov, that government has uh, stopped preparations to the signing of the agreement. No one understood what does it mean, why Azarov has anything to do with the back then still negotiated agreement. And the very first reactions of, reaction of Ukrainian was, what is going on in the country? Why something that ha we have been promised for, for last two years, suddenly becomes stopped, sudden, suddenly it's not happening? Uh, that is why eventually Ukrainians came to Maidan. And for the first week, from the 21st of November till the 28th, 29th of November, till the Vilnius summit, uh, Euromaidan had only one demand. Back then it wasn't about regime change. It wasn't about changing the country and having Yanukovych and his regime out. It was just about signing association agreement. So we really had very concrete demand from the side of like the civil sector uh, towards the government. Everything has changed on the 9th of the 29th of November when students who have stayed um, to stay at night uh, on the Independence Square, they, they were beaten by special forces. I remember very well, because I've been of every single day on Maidan, and I remember reactions of the people. So on Friday, they were very much disappointed. And if police wouldn't attack people, I could guarantee almost with 100% certainty that sooner or later they would leave Maidan themselves. But after young students, people who already have been born in Ukraine, and they don't remember the Soviet times and how aggressive police might be, this was the biggest shock for the society, that suddenly, just for being there, just not even protesting, but demonstrating your will, demonstrating your ideas, you, you got beaten by police. And that was the moment when, because the first week it was mostly students, artists, journalists, so this young generation of Ukrainians. But afterwards, when these young people have been beaten, the older generations has come, let's say, so our parents, someone of the age of our parents saying that we won't allow our children to be beaten. This is how Euromaidan has developed, and this is why um, the question on stake on Euromaidan became how to change the country and how to change the regime. It wasn't just about, um, about association agreement anymore. So this was the internal dynamics of, of Euromaidan, and later on, um, after a month and a half, when in the middle of January, Verkhovna Rada, still controlled by uh, Yanukovych and his party, has voted so for so-called dictatorship laws, which were controlling... The aim of those laws was really bringing Ukraine, like making Ukraine the North Korea of Europe, because it was uh, cancelling the right, like forbidding all the protests, all the peaceful demonstrations and gatherings in the city centers, uh, wearing helmets or any kind of protection. Um, also, um, they were... They were forbidden us criticizing politicians, writing every single bad word about the government, about the president. Um, the media were, were under very strict control, so making really state uh, interfering in every single sphere that we had. And um, back then, I mean, in the middle of January, it became obvious for us, especially for people standing on Maidan, that there is no way for us to coexist in the same state. So it's either people with this, uh, with this movement based on liberal values, because back then we were already a revolution of dignity. Back then we already were asking for freedom, for dignity, and for justice in our society. And we've seen that we won't be able to make it with this government and with this president. Events have developed very quickly, because Euromaidan wasn't just in Kyiv. It wasn't just a local event in Maidan city center. In the mid-February, mid when there were very serious clashes taking place in Kyiv, local Maidans, local demonstrations in all around Ukraine, and actually the geography is really very interesting because on the highest point, um, all local administrations in all regions in Ukraine were attacked and there was attempts to seize the power, let's say so, the, to seize the building of, the, of, the administ of public administration in the city, except of two regions. There was no such demonstrations in Sevastopol, meaning there was no Crimea involved, and Luhansk. Even in Donetsk, even in Donetsk, there were protests. So you can see that Euromaidan was just about whole Ukraine. It wasn't just a bunch of people in Kyiv who were protesting and fighting with police, um, demanding some things that 
uh, that aren't interested, interesting for the rest of the country, but it was really the, the national-wide movement. And obviously the, the darkest page, something that it was very hard for us to predict. I mean, at certain point, we people on Maidan, we understood that, okay, after the dictatorship laws have been passed, um, it's either we go to jail or we win. And to be honest, we were more prepared to see more police and more, let's say, so APCs or tanks on Maidan, but snipers were a total surprise. And after that, uh, the reaction of the country was just complete turn down. Because you also have to understand and remember that throughout the whole time when Euromaidan was taking place, we weren't perceived um, very positively in Ukraine because the media, which, were, which are still controlled by mostly oligarchs, uh, they were portraying us obviously as someone who is breaking the public order, uh, who is creating these very stressful situations in the country. But everything has changed only with the moment when people were shot. It was too obvious that people who stand in the middle of the um, in the middle of the square with flags and saying we want a better life and better future, being shot by policemen and special forces, it's just a little bit not fitting, so something is wrong. And um, I know that we are very strict with time and I was trying to limit myself. I would just bring few few issues I, which I think will be very interesting in the course of our later discussion. So uh, with Yanukovych, first of all, and what he was doing in Ukraine, and why people really, after this first beating, they said, okay, it's enough, because already there are too many wrong things taking place in our country. Uh, and uh, it's really also very interesting to see the Russian influence, because um, with Yanukovych's government, a lot of people who were originally Russians and had Russian citizenship started working in Ukrainian ministries. Um, it's a fact that you can, ch you can check everywhere, on even Wikipedia, I'm sure there, there is an English page for that. Uh, why Ukrainian army was so badly equipped and actually was almost non-existent because um, in Yanukovych regime, not regime, but actually in his government, um, we had a minister of defense who was Russian, who changed his citizenship from Russian to Ukrainian one only when he started to work for Ukrainian government. Also, the chief of uh, security service of Ukraine was originally Russian and who moved to Ukraine just to work for the Yanukovych government. So you see that um, when you see Western countries and Russia, Western countries, they are sending experts who are ready to help with their knowledge, with their experience, but still they don't have this executive power. And when Russians take part in the game, they bring people inside and try to shake the, or shake or to shape, let's say so, some institutions from the inside. Um, and also another thing um, is about what Russia planned towards Ukraine and what is Yanukovych's role in it. Right after Maidan, I started working in Ukrainian government, and since I was, uh, I was having a quite nice position within this government, I was allowed also to, um, to be present during the closed meetings of Ukrainian government, because first weeks were very, very nervous, actually, for us, very challenging, and uh, most of the governmental meetings were closed. So, um, what Yanukovych and what his government and his ministers were doing, is that apparently there was a plan with Russia. I mean, this is something, obviously, it still lies on the level of speculations, but based on what, they, what was going on with the budget, they were pumping out money from every single sphere they wanted. So it might look like that Ukrainian economy becomes so weak, uh, so defaulted, and so really like not, not being able to sustain on her own, then here we have Russia, uh, which is ready to help Ukraine, obviously, bringing it even closer. So probably there was a plan of very slow reintegration of Ukraine back into Russian structures, starting first from financial aid. And another thing is that um, what is Jonas brought, uh, how West uh, actually reacted on events in Crimea. Um, West indeed insisted or very much recommended Ukraine not to start any military action in Crimea. Because they said that if Ukraine is doing this, it stands on their own. Because um, we had two big problems. So the government that uh, entered the power in just few days, and it's just impossible to take control over the country in few days. And you have invasion on Crimea. On the other hand, uh, you're almost bankrupt. And uh, the deal was more or less: okay, if you decide not to fight with Russia we will be able to provide you with enough financial support to keep the rest of the country on float. But if you're engaging in the war, we can't help a country in the state of war. So the government was 
let's say, so motivated to make a decision and obviously they decided to, okay, let's better to save the rest of 25 regions uh, rather than to fight without an army for just Crimea. And it was very long as always. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, th thanks a lot, Kasia. I think that's that's really interesting for us to hear from your inside perspective. I think a very very good overview. There was one question I would like to ask you very very briefly because this is a reading of the events that is is very widespread in in Western Europe. That um, in the end, it might be the EU and the EU's action to blame for the escalation of events and Russian aggression. How would you react to that uh, reading? Me or Jonas? Uh, I, I was I was asking you, but, but we can also ask you that. <laughs> okay, so with European Union, first of all, um, what I'm I'm sh I'm sure that people who are studying European Union and probably working in the European Union understand very well that um, it's really very hard to criticize Union for lack of actions because someone or someone has compared Union with a huge ship which is on float, which is very stable, which is very reliable, but it's really very hard to maneuver. And with the events that were taking place in Ukraine, very quickly, very challenging, um, it would be some kind of a dream world to, to expect that European Union will be, European Union, which exists of 28 member states with different interests, with different perspectives, with different reading of the situation, and also on another level you have institutions which also have their interest and their perspective of events, uh, then suddenly in a few days they will be able to make a decision and to stop the aggression or to prevent it somehow. That is why in this, uh, in this regard um, I wouldn't expect that much of the Union. Obviously, probably this criticism um, goes very much from their expectations towards the European Union and its reading normative power and this role which is trying to play uh, within the European continent. Uh, but um, mostly what, who could do more? Um, those are certain European member states because it, on this level I would say that those are rather member states who could do more rather than European Union as such and using instruments that first of all European Union has because first of all we look about and look what European Union might do on the other hand we look on realistically what what can be done with the instruments and capacities European Union have that is why obviously you can always demand more uh, but um, I was very much realistic about European Union already on Maidan because we, we, we've been asking and writing letters and saying, okay, you, they are beating us and you are just answering, we are very much deeply concerned. So this is pretty much what European Union can say. European Union can press someone with words, with demands, with slogans, but when it comes to real actions, we have to be very modest, first of all, in what European Union can do. Thanks. And as answering briefly, I don't think that European Union could do that much in stopping of the of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Right. Okay. Thank you, Jonas. Would you would you like to comment on that? Yes. Um, I mean, I was referring to that when I talked about the clauses. There is this narrative mainly um, uh, on the European right, but I'm afraid also on the European left, um, at least in parts. That basically says the European Union is this. Um, big um, plotting um, conspiracy of technocrats that basically has a neoliberal agenda and tries to secure um, raw materials and suck everything in um, and thereby um, violating the legitimate interests of an old great power, namely Russia. I think this really has got it completely backwards because if you look at how Ukraine and the EU interacted with each other, you will find that actually Ukraine was pushing towards integration, whereas the EU was extremely skeptical. Now, this skepticism of the EU is simply a function of, usually the EU does things when everybody of its member states wants it. And when does every member state want it? Well, if it's clear that there will be a benefit and that it will be a tangible benefit. In Ukraine, an extremely, um, this is not to the detriment of its people, but Ukraine, the, the economy and the politics of Ukraine are corrupt, they are unstable, and there is huge infighting in the country, um, sadly. That is why the EU was extremely reluctant to give any assurances, whereas on the Ukrainian side, on both sides of the spectrum, there have been very strong incentives to integrate. 
And that you can trace back even to Kuchner, who was um, president in the 90s and who is the political father of Yanukovych. So that is something to really keep in mind. The Ukraine said it wanted as quickly as possible um, a partnership and cooperation agreement with the European Union, got it, and then immediately pushed for a deeper integration and spoke about the goal of integrating as a complete member state into the European Union, even under Kuchma. This radicalized under the, uh, after the Orange Revolution, and there the European Union, and research has shown this, all of a sudden thought, we cannot say no that much anymore, because this is a democratic revolution that obviously um, stood on the squares, defied police, and um, waved the Euro European Union flag. So, but even then, under Yanukovych, we should just remind ourselves that the negotiations of today's deep and comprehensive free trade agreements were made under his auspices, as authoritarian and horrible as his regime was. Um, so why is this? This is because the European Union is a huge market and has the tools to um, give Ukraine some sort of economic governance that it badly, badly needs. So there are very objective reasons to do so. Another um, function of such an integration is that the Russian attempts um, are counterfeited. This is namely another continuity we see in Ukrainian behavior, namely the, uh, um, the attempt to insulate itself from um, the influence of Russia by not joining its military alliances, the CSTO, that has a lot of members, um, for example, Belarus, by not joining uh, most of the economic agreements that Russia continuously proposed towards it, and even gave a lot of economic incentives to do so. Ukraine rephrased, uh, refrained from that because they were feeling it would impede on the sovereignty of the state and of the government that was in charge. And that even applies to the so-called Russell funds. Um, who always tried to retain an amount of sovereignty towards Putin. So um, this is just to say that this whole idea of um, a straightforward, planning, aggressive, expansionist um, European Union within Ukraine really has it the wrong way. And this is very much visible in the data. Thanks. We already got uh, a couple of questions from uh, the audience. I would just like to remind everyone who just joined us um, in this um, Hangout that you are able to um, send questions to us on the Facebook page where you've just clicked the link um, to, be, to be listening in. And I will ask these questions to our um, panelists. Let's move on to the current challenges, if that's all right. It feels like, if you look at the current news, um, that Poroshenko is saying the right things internationally, but isn't really supporting change domestically. There's an economics minister who has been um, perceived as very progressive, who uh, resigned from his post lately. Uh, decentralization reforms didn't go through parliament. There's been... Um, a vote on um, Yatsenyuk as, as the Prime Minister, who was able to retain his mandate, but um, um, he's increasingly becoming um, questioned by, by, um, by the Parliament. Um, there was also a letter by 10 ambassadors to, the, to Ukraine, including the US, uh, Germany, France, the UK, Canada, um, basically stating that they're disappointed with the progress made. Um, is it fair to say that the Euromaidan movement is not really represented anymore in this current government? Katya? No, and actually this is something that recently I've been commenting and writing about very, very often, because obviously when we look um, into Ukraine's history and people who are writing about Ukraine, there is always this tendency to compare things. So you take something as, the, as a starting point and then you compare everything which happened afterwards to this. And, um, well, this happened this way in Ukraine that everyone is comparing Euromaidan and obviously everything that would happen in our future to Orange Revolution. So they're saying, okay, it was a failed revolution because it didn't provide uh, some measurable political change and, some, and, and it didn't change country the way that people on back then Orange uh, Maidan wanted it. 
And then I'm bringing uh, the like the, the motive of Euromaidan, which was much wider than than political change. And this is the, which is the most important thing to understand about right now in Ukraine that we have this generational change because Maidan has demanded actually very wide things. It has asked for just society, for the rule of law, for the respect of human dignity, and for basic freedoms. So if you if you look at this, you have the classical demands of French Revolution of every single book which is talking about ideal states and this is what Euromaidan wanted to rebuild Ukraine into this perfect state which is obviously can't be made just no matter how we would like it but you have the reality you have the economical reality you have the political reality and also you have to look at the age of people I mean those who are standing on Maidan in most of the cases they're much much younger than those who are running country now and you have to remember that those people who are right now that represent country and run the country these are the Soviet type people who have been born, raised, and used to the Soviet reality. And independent Ukraine is a different, maybe not absolutely different, but we're changing with every single month, I would say. So changes on Euromaidan were very broad and they have affected not only the political level. So it wasn't just about the change of the face of the president or the, the composition of the government, but it has introduced and provoked the changes on all the levels of society, volunteering movements, uh, volunteering battalions, uh, civic organizations, musicians, artists, like it looks like the country has woken up and that is why it's really very important to see that no matter what uh, lack of really or not satisfying um, performance we see on the level of the politicians because it really has taken place. The people who represent still the old system they work very much on the preservation of the old system. And this is very much what the letter of the ambassadors was about, that very little promised reforms were introduced and uh, the patience was running very, very thin because from the very beginning the demand for reforms and for the changes of the countries were very in the country were very high. This is what maybe for the first time in the, his in the modern history uh, that the people of the country said that, look, we know that the, the reforms will be very harsh, but we want to change our country. So there was this popular demand for reforms. But the position of authorities was you can't reform the country and wage the war at the same time. And that is why for the most of the year when uh, escalations of the, of the war in the eastern Ukraine were taking place, people were closing eyes and saying, yes, we have to win the war. And trust me, when you have friends or friends of yours returning in coffins from the west, from the east of the country, you kind of understand that yes, there are better, there are other things that you have to focus on. But now, when uh, the escalation has stopped more or less, and we don't have such a fight as we used to have a year or two years ago, now people tend to look again to Kyiv and to government and to president and asking, okay, so what have you done? And it looks like that they have provided very little change because they are returning to old practices which were under Kuchma, under Yanukovych, meaning that they don't want to shake the system, but they want to lead the system, which is very like this very, uh, very clear vertical of power when you're controlling everything and you have access to money flows. But this is not what people want. And we still have this demand. Obviously, it's much lower than right after Maidan. But people have changed. What Maidan have changed, and which is irreversible, is that Ukrainians have felt the power. They felt that they mean something for the country, and uh, whatever they are doing for their country will have some aftermath. It's not like you live in your house and you are simply disconnected from the rest of the society. People started to understand that it's not the government for whom you should work. Actually, government should work for people and for the country. So Maidan didn't, didn't disappear. It's still over there flying in the air of Ukraine. <laughs> okay. Um, would, you say, would you say the government is doing as much as it possibly can, given the, given the current circumstances? And is there something that Western partners, be it the EU, be it member states, be it um, transatlantic partners, could do to support faster changes, more radical changes um, at, at this point in time? Um, that's very interesting and very tricky question because in order to answer it, um, probably there is no right answer. So I just can explain the situation on different levels. So first of all, um, I can't deny that there were certain changes that have been made. So I'm not this one, I'm not the person who is blindly criticizing because I don't like authorities and I didn't expect country to be changed within one year. Even during Maidan when I was asked this question, okay, so 
um, you asked for a change. So what the, this change should be and when you expect in this, I was always ans answering that I'm an optimist. So if in 15 years we will see, we will see uh, the first results, first changes after Euromaidan, it will be very great. But um, to be honest, the opportunity that the post-Euromaidan government and obviously president had is just incredible because they had like this carte blanche for, for the country and they truly could do everything they wanted because the whole power was in their hands. And even though they have introduced some changes, it's not enough because they could have done more. And the thing that um, why they haven't done more, I think, lies in because, because of their political interest and because of their conscious choice. And this is why Western partners start pressuring Ukraine and they start saying that, okay, you have to fight corruption because corruption is a very nice word and uh, I, sometimes, I sometimes feel that it's being misused, misused because everyone is saying, okay, fight corruption, fight corruption. The problem is that all the money which are going into Ukraine and the financial support for Ukraine was quite sufficient, I would say so. Obviously not enough uh, for the certain circumstances, but you also can't ask too much. But the problem with corruption is that the money that European Union or United Nations or IMF are taking, are given, for example, for support of the level, um, the, the middle class businessmen or the restoration of Donbass, there is a very slight chance that this money will reach people, will, will uh, reach people on the, the, slow, the slowest uh, grounds. And that is why Western countries are pressuring Ukraine and saying that, okay, you have to show the results because we know that by sending money, we're feeding your pockets and not pockets of Ukrainians. What can be done is to be patient with Ukraine because no matter how bad what I'm saying sounds, it won't be changed in a year. We simply, unfortunately, need the change of generations, and I'm sure that um, that Ukrainians who will enter European, uh, who will enter Parliament or government in a few years, they will be maybe not absolutely different, but they will be different from people who are running country now. So I understand it's something hard to ask, just saying that be patient with our problems. But this is probably the best, not advice, but maybe this uh, friendly request from the Western countries. Because Ukraine has a future and it has a potential, but uh, the circumstances right now look like we can't use all the potential right now. We simply need time to more people enter the, enter the, the authorities, this highest level, to become political elites. Because in our country, it's more or less about the change of generations, to bring in new people with a new way of thinking, with, um, with this open-minded people, Europe-oriented, to the authorities. And I'm sure that back then they will reform absolutely, they will perform absolutely different than those who are running the country now. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, I think we need to uh, make a move quickly to the, to the referendum. Um, as we we are sort of sort of running out of time, and we still get some questions to answer. There's just one question on the broader geopolitical um, topic that I, that I would like to ask all of you and um, whoever wants to pick up this question. Gorbachev said a new Cold War has started. Do you think that is true? I would I would like to say something about that. Um, Gorbachev is not alone. I mean, um, a lot of people have said so, um, sometimes for effect, I'm afraid. For example, um, in the, the prominent think tank Carnegie um, has an office in Moscow, and um, Trenin, a very prominent scholar there, has used the same words. I think this is completely mistaken. The Cold War was a confrontation of two military superpowers um, that were ideologically um, completely opposed to one another. Russia is not a superpower. Russia is a very powerful state. It has the world's third or fourth um, largest military expenditure. It has a lot, a lot of nuclear weapons and a lot of European gas comes from Russia. But it also only has the economic size of Italy. And this is not to say anything against the detriment of Italy, but it's not as impressive um, as would be anything like China or the European Union or the US. Also, the Russian ideology, um, um, if you want to call it like that, is more of a syncretic mishmash of um, nationalism, conservatism, and an old idea of um, a more imperial um, conception of world politics. And that all of that um, doesn't make for 
as a hostile confrontation as does the Cold War. And it, I think it's foolish to think in these terms because if you do, you will end up at the conclusion that everything must be a conflict, that violence and pressure is the only chance to resolve a conflict, and that is a recipe that has not even worked in the Cold War. So, um, therefore, I um, would caution anybody to use that terminology. As Katya has already said, um, now that the conflict is slowly freezing in, Ukrainian civil society is again turning towards its government and makes all these very legitimate and very important demands. We should not forget building a stable, prosperous, and democratic state takes a lot of time. Just imagine what happens when in Europe, that is proper, prosperous and stable, there is a crisis within a ruling coalition and everything stands still. Now imagine you do that in a country that is at war and that is losing 11% of its GDP in 2015. So patience is needed um, from all sides. Okay, thanks, Jonas. Let us move to the, uh, to the referendum in the, in the Netherlands. And we got Tom here, who is uh, a member of Jeff in the Netherlands. Um, and Tom will be able to give us a bit of an overview on, on what is happening, where is this referendum coming from, and, and perhaps also, and how far is this about Ukraine? And do people realize that this will affect you Ukraine relations? Yes, thank you. Um, just to get back a bit to the question you actually asked about whether this is a new Cold War, like uh, Max, I'd actually say no, uh, it's not. And that has in part to do with um, with the, what we see is happening in, in our referendum right now. I'd rather say that we're not so much seeing a new Cold War as a sort of authoritarian, conservative um, movement popping up everywhere in Russia, also in, uh, in Turkey, in the form of Erdogan, but also in the Netherlands. Um, and it's interesting to see several uh, parallels, actually, with what um, with what Katja said, uh, but inversed. So just to begin with, um, who has organized the referendum? It's been organized by uh, Geen Pijl. That is a combination of um, the Citizens Committee EU, which is an anti-EU organization in the Netherlands, which wants to uh, leave the EU, which wants a Dutch exit from the European Union, and uh, Geen Stijl. And Geen Stijl is a media platform um, of the um, conserv well, not conservative right, but the anti-establishment right. And it's born out of a movement which um, started more or less around 2000 as a reaction to the more or less third way politics, so the, the um, uh, Tony Blair kind of politics, which we also had. Um, and they're very much yeah, directed against anything which stinks of technocracy, which they what what they perceive as technocracy. Um, so they used a new law which we have adopted uh, in the beginning of this year uh, in order to launch a referendum, a consultative referendum, not a binding referendum, which is very important. A binding referendum isn't actually possible in our uh, in our polity. Um, and for that, they had to gather 400,000 signatures. They succeeded in that, and uh, that's why we have the referendum now. But it's very interesting because they started um, doing this in June this year, more or less. And they chose the topic of the Ukraine treaty, not so much because of the Ukraine treaty. They first had a different topic, but they were too late with handing in their application, so they quickly devised up um, a new topic and was the Ukraine Treaty. Um, so actually it's kind of the victim of um, yeah, of this new surge of uh, the anti-establishment right in the Netherlands. Um, one of the slogans, or not one of the slogans, one of the um, motivations behind um, the, the petition itself was, and I a translation, but I quote, um, to stimulate the dormant discussion about democracy itself and improve the debate in general. So the whole Ukraine treaty is is not really the real focus of it. 
Um, we have as Jeff Netherlands, Netherlands organized a debate last week um, about the Ukraine referendum. We uh, invited a speaker from the Burger Committee EU, and it was very important to note that he uh, constantly tried to pull the discussion away from the treaty towards um, why uh, the why the Netherlands should leave uh, the EU. Um, it's also interesting, though, to note that, and this is to come back at what I said in the beginning, that this is more or less uh, part of this international surge of the uh, conservative authoritarian right, that they consequently appropriate elements of Putin's narrative and they consequently appropriate um, his style of communication. You could see this very clearly in the debate where um, uh, Ion van Dijkshoorn, the speaker from, for the Citizens Committee, um, continuously, like again and again, said uh, the EU is a colonialist power. It is colonizing U the Ukraine. It is, um, yeah, having an imperial influence on Ukraine. Um, we had a Ukrainian speaker who said, uh, which I thought was a good remark. I I don't know many countries which have wanted to be colonized, um, and Ukraine seems to be very intent on having this treaty realized. But so that's that's more or less the the background behind it. And then the debate itself, like I said, it incorporates elements from Putin's narrative. But for the rest it's more or less a very introspective affair. It's very much um, directed towards what what does this referendum mean for um, Dutch internal political relations. What does it mean for our uh, constitutional arrangement? Because we can't have uh, binding referendums constitutionally, but the government has said we will respect the outcome. So whatever happens, uh, we will. If, they, if the vote is no, then we will say no. Now um, that might be a problem, of course, for the treaty itself, although. Um, we do know that um, several people have said, well, then we'll see if we can get an opt-out so that the treaty continues existing, but then with one member state less, although this is, of course, a dangerous precedent uh, for the functioning of the European Union. Yeah, th thank you, Tom. I think these were really interesting insights and, and the debate. Uh, and I must say, it does sound, it does sound rather dangerous to have a, a debate with very serious consequences on, on EU um, neighborhood relations um, that are basically only about domestic matters. How is this, how is this discussion perceived in, in Ukraine, if I may ask, Katya? Thank you very much. Actually, this is something I wanted to comment. And um, in Ukraine, and especially on Maidan, where most of our slogans were about European Union, when we were saying that we are part of Europe and we are Europeans, um, we made this very loud statement. And um, back then, neither civil society nor the country, because of the, the officials of Ukraine, like President, they were saying that uh, European integration is the ultimate goal of Ukrainian foreign policy. And in the nearest future, or maybe not in such a near future, we would like to become a member of the European Union. The interesting thing is that we have never ever heard an answer from the European side. From, on the level of institution, on the level of, of uh, top officials, there is no clear answer, yes or no, whether Ukraine has a chance to become a European m member in the nearest or not so such a near future. The answer is always, you have the criteria, the moment when you will be able to like to to match the criteria to the criteria then we will start the discussion but it's rather running away from the answer rather than saying yes or no directly on the other hand uh, we have never ever had a situation where actually not officials of the european union but europeans themselves would have a chance to say what they think about ukraine and what they think about this closing relations uh, closer relations between european countries and ukraine and on one hand, Dutch referendum would be a great opportunity for Europeans, because obviously Dutch citizens are Europeans, um, to say to Ukrainians, yes or no, what we think about you. 
And this is very tricky. This is very tricky thing because I know from my friends in the Netherlands that they would like to keep uh, the, the issue of referendum as local as possible, saying it's our matter, it's our country, it's our right guaranteed in the constitution. That is why we don't want it to be brought on the level of the European Union and decided upon the future and so on. On the other hand, other people are saying that uh, the no in referendum will will say that there is something very wrong going in European Union, and we want to tickle on this. Uh, from the side of Ukraine, the, the very issue of referendum is very sensitive for us because I wouldn't say that people feel betrayed, not at this point. Uh, and this is something that I'm always uh, also trying to explain to my Ukrainian friends that the very fact the referendum is taking place shouldn't be criticized. This is the democratic right of the citizens of the country to use the law which is guaranteed in the constitution. And yes, Ukraine happened to be the subject but this is our role and this is our aim to promote and to, to motivate them to, to vote yes, not to say the referendum itself is a, is a sign of betrayal. But um, it's not that I'm predicting things and I'm more than sure that it will be this way, that if uh, the result of referendum will be no, uh, it will have a huge impact uh, on the level of maybe not European support of Ukrainians because still you have to understand that uh, European Union and this European, those European inspirations of Ukrainians are some kind of the dream. So this is something that we are aiming for. And it's hardly one referendum that can change this, but it will very strongly shake the position of pro-European uh, parties, including those which are currently forming the, the parliamentary coalition, because they already have a shaken position. As I mentioned before, Yatsenyuk, uh, mo not most probably, his party has around 3% of support right now. There is no chance that he will make it to the government, into the parliament. Poroshenko himself, he has around 16% of support. It's almost 10 or 9 percentage drop uh, compared to the results of the 2014 uh, parliamentary elections. So these parties are uh, already weakened. And then when you have another blow, uh, another argument for anti, like may, may, maybe not anti-European parties, but rather European skeptic, skeptical parties in Ukraine saying that, okay, but European Union doesn't want you. You're saying that this is your main goal, but actually no one is waiting for you. Uh, I think it will have, um, in the short term, it will have some negative impact on moods in Ukraine. And uh, going back to Dutch, interest first of all, and uh, voting in the referendum, yes or no, uh, we have to understand, go looking very, very um, into the into the very um, association agreement and what it is about. First of all, it will be in the interest of Dutch people to vote yes, because the association agreement itself consists in 80% from DCFTA, meaning free and comprehensive, deep free and comprehensive trade uh, trade zone. And um, the way that trade relations between Ukraine and the European Union look right now, look the way that. European Union member states have a free and complete access to the Ukrainian market. And you have to understand that this is 33 million of customers and the country, when we close, when we, when we don't perceive Russia as a European country, Ukraine is the biggest European country. So this is huge market. Ukraine right now doesn't have a free access to the European market. We still have a lot of limitations because it doesn't matter that DCFTA has entered into force. Ukrainian companies have, have to meet uh, the European standards. And it's a very lasting process. And it doesn't mean that we have the, the, set, the level of... Uh, benefits from the DCFT8 on the same level. So if Dutch referendum will be no and if government will decide to opt out from DCFT8, it will hurt, hurt first of all the Dutch citizens and Dutch uh, companies which are trading with Ukraine. So we have to remember about this as well. Christopher, we can't hear you. All right. Okay, thanks. Tom, can I, can I ask you, um, how, how is the debate currently um, going in, in the Netherlands? Are people actually debating the influence of the DCFTA? Uh, or what, what is the debate about? And how come so many people speak out for not voting at all? And perhaps, if we can add to that, um, this is the first referendum on a foreign policy topic. Are we to expect um, that the Netherlands will hold referendums on all sorts of EU foreign policy issues in the future? Um, 
maybe I should actually start with the with the last question first. Um, it is very much possible. Why? Because in general, there is now a sort of a referendum surge going on in the Netherlands. Um, for example, when we look, or actually the other example is uh, with the refugee crisis. Uh, many there have been many calls for referendums at the level of municipalities for municipalities to be able to say no we don't want refugees in our municipality uh, it's an idea which has been labeled in a Dutch newspaper um, total democracy um, very much in, in parallel to yeah the total and Krieg like they said in uh, in another <laughs> era of history um, so a sort of a uh, total determination of the political process by referendums, and um, it's it's interesting to hear uh, Katja's remark about very consistent remark about okay we have to respect referendums um, because it is in a democratic polity. But the problem is um, that at the moment we have an illiberal people. Uh, standing up against uh, a liberal establishment and not the other way around as in uh, as in Ukraine um, that is also why I think that the argument of um, the Netherlands losing out economically when they do not opt in uh, to the ref uh, to the treaty um, kind of misses the point it is true but this is not a referendum about um, about facts and figures and about economic growth, etc. It is something about um, feeling. And in the Netherlands, in the past decades, there's never really been an investment in feeling European. People very much do still feel Dutch. Um, that's also why there have been some uh, some debates about the economic impact and some articles about the economic impact of the treaty and whether it is beneficial and whether it is not and whether it pr promotes uh, Ukrainian membership which is even though it's not true it's very widely believed that it's the first step to membership or that it's uh, membership uh, under another guise um, so the focus has been much more on uh, let's stick it like let's stick it up to the EU and not so much about um, what does this mean for us as a country um, which is disappointing but it is also the reality and it is also um, the result partially of, of the EU's functioning but also partially because of um, a lack of investment of our uh, political establishment in um, pro-European feeling and in European identity as such. Have I skipped anything, or I think there was more or less it? No. Yeah, I think I think you answered my questions. Um, as as we're running out of time, I would just ask um, a last question to each each of you, um, and and hope you'll be able to give me a very brisk and uh, short answer to to this. Um, let, let me start with you, Katja. If you had the magic wand to make the European Council take one decision um, the way you want it, what would you choose? Very hard and very challenging question, I have to say. Um, to be honest, uh, what I would like European Council to see. Definitely there is one thing that I don't want European Council to see in uh, I think in the end of June uh, is cancelling sanctions against, the, 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 against Russia. I would like sanctions to be prolonged uh, even though I know the effect of the sanctions debatably very low from the European sanctions and such but then you have to understand that um, when it comes to sanctions of the European Union towards Russia and note that what conscious sections of Russia causing in the European, in the European Union uh, inside. I mean, mostly uh, Italian farmers and uh, French uh, farmers as well who are protesting against the sanctions. They aren't protesting against the European sanctions, but against Russian conscious sections. So uh, you have to be very clear about these issues. But um, it shows it's very strong symbol symbolical support because it shows that 
We clearly have Ukraine, which has been in disadvantaged position, which has been attacked, and sanctions aren't that much only about economical impact. It's about showing the European Union, first of all, European Union unity, first of all, uh, facing Russia, supporting Ukraine. Uh, that is why I would like European Union um, to be able to find the willingness and understanding among European member states uh, to prolong sanctions and to know that it has very strong effect, first of all, on the morals of people in Ukraine, but also in the European Union. Because the, the last thing that also Europeans need to see is that European Union isn't able to make a decision in the very challenging times and is falling apart and every single country is thinking just about its own interests. The European Union is much more important and much broader and higher. It's, a, it's about the ability of thinking of uh, the interests of all of us and all of the 28 member states, not about just the particular interests of one country. So this is something that I truly wish to, to my European friends all around Europe and also in the European Council <laughs> to be responsible about their decisions. Great, thank you. So one question um, for you. Um, um, that, I, that I would, let, let me put it this way. Very briefly and, and simply, um, looking at, at you, you uh, Russia security policy, why is it in the interest of the EU um, to have a stable and uh, and democratic Ukraine that is integrated in the in the EU system. Mm, um, the thing is, you have you have two notions of interest there. Um, if it was for my personal political preferences, Ukraine would be a stable, prosperous democracy right away. If you define interest more narrowly in terms of realpolitik, um, and I think it's important to ask that question as well because there you can appeal even to those that don't sympathize with the values of um, the young Ukrainians at Maidan, um, namely in terms of security and stability. The question is also, yes, it's very much in the interest of the European Union. And let me just draw you a picture that is as brief uh, as possible. Now, Ukraine is a country that has almost half of the population size of Germany, which is by far the biggest um, EU member state. This population is uh, quite well educated um, and therefore presents, um, in cynical terms, a cheap and qualified labor force that is very eager to um, put their talents to use. Um, second of all, Ukraine is a major importer of grain, uh, exporter of grains. And there are a lot of um, possibilities to enlarge trade, as um, Katya already mentioned. And third, um, if there was actually an escalation in Ukraine, which is a danger I think we have not entirely missed yet, we would face a problem that we have not seen so far. Um, Ukraine has two and a half times more inhabitants than has Syria. And if you see what the refugee crisis is doing to Europe, and to European solidarity and to European values. Just imagine if you would have a real um, civil war of enormous dimensions within Ukraine. Um, that is in nobody's interest, and it's certainly not in the interest of the three Schengen countries that directly um, border Ukraine. So as a matter of cold realpolitik, we should make sure that the conflict at least remains frozen um, and that we uh, contribute to stabilizing Ukraine, because otherwise uh, troubles are ahead. So I think we do, and you do, um, from the Jeff, uh, everything that you can do to bring that about. Thank you, Jonas. And and to Tom, uh, one more question on the on the referendum. As um, Jonas just said, we we from Jeff do everything to. Um, to provide a, a, a debate about the future of Europe. What are you doing in the Netherlands to make people discuss um, the, the content of, uh, of the DCFTA and the actual scope of the decision rather than some blurry lines? Well, first we try to post through the Ukraine debate uh, in mass just now. First, our um, capacities, our direct capacities in the Netherlands are limited. Um, because it is not a very 
uh, pro-European culture, so it's not a very big organization here, although we're, of course, trying to, uh, to change that. Um, for the rest, we're trying to serve as an amplifier for other voices um, who do try to have a, a debate about the content of the treaty, and uh, we try to spread that information as much as possible. And that's Thanks. about it. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. There's one more question that has just come in um, that I would like to ask Katya. The question is, how does the Ukraine perceive the growing Euroscepticism in, in EU Eastern states and, and the neighbors of Ukraine? And does that have an impact on the relations between um, the EU and Ukraine? So um, this will be one of the very rare moments when I'm criticizing Ukraine as such, not authorities, but Ukrainians. Uh, the thing is that um, Ukraine, especially in the media sphere, and how it shapes the interests of people and their perceivement of the world. So Ukrainians in the given situation, in the present times, are very much focused, first of all, on the domestic events. And then we still live in this... Um, very, very, still having very close relations and very close ties to Russia. And it's, re it's really very easy to see when you follow the Ukrainian news or what is the main topics of the debate. So mainly Ukrainians are talking about the domestic problems and then more or less what is going wrong with Russia and uh, how wrong Russia is and how bad things are going on in there. To be honest, there is very little, almost no debate about the European Union itself, the state of the affairs in the European Union, not to mention the particular uh, state, member states and what is going on in there. That is why, um, especially when it comes to Eastern European countries, I think that Poland is uh, something that uh, was meant in this question. So Ukraine has um, bilateral relations with Poland, which hasn't changed, to be honest. Uh, despite of the change of the government, uh, quite, maybe not radical, but a significant, very visible change in the government uh, of Poland and actually what Polish authorities are doing, it's uh, more or less, but to a certain extent right now, to this point, that hadn't affected relations between Poland and Ukraine. So Poland remains a very strong supporter of Ukraine. Uh, it uh, has confirmed its commitments, which uh, were made by the previous authorities. So there is no such a change. So I think that the Euroscepticism, which is uh, being addressed and be, be, is being voiced on the, um, on the level of the European Union and on the level of the certain member states, also to mention Hungary and so on, um, when it comes to the external relations, you can't feel that much of it. Uh, definitely at this point, um, two, two years since Maidan, two, two years since the violent uh, events on Maidan, and everything which was taking place in Ukraine, even though that certain European countries uh, have been experiencing this way of Euroscepticism, uh, it hasn't that much affected the relations between these countries and Ukraine. When it comes to Euroscepticism in general, I would say that maybe Ukrainians aren't that much familiar with those camps in European Union. So um, the different camps which um, which debate and actually trying to promote different models of European Union, how European Union should look like, Euro-optimist and Euroskeptics. I, th I have to say that Ukraine is, still needs a lot of education about the European Union, and this is something that is in interest not of Ukrainian authorities, but also of the European Union it itself, and of the representatives of the European Union, educating Ukrainians about what European Union is, and uh, about these different streams of uh, points of view inside the European Union, because Ukrainians who are very easily lost, depending on um, to which source they will turn out, for example, if they take in information or they, they've read about some Euroscepticist <laughs> party, and they take it for granted that this is the state of the affair in the whole European Union. So there is much education needed, and uh, I have to say that for, for us, European Union still remains this dreamland. And it's really very interesting to see when I remember I was having a conference in Poland um, still during the Euromaidan, and um, most of, maybe not most, but there were many, there were many uh, politicians who 
uh, were solidarity members and who actually were working in the in the governments at the moment when uh, Poland has entered European Union. And after the conference, while I was obviously answering questions about European Union, about Ukraine and what we think and how we feel about European Union, they came to me and they said that what Ukraine is experiencing right now, this Euro-optimism, is very much uh, the same what Poland has thought and has felt about European Union. So for us, it remains on the level of the dream, not on the level of concrete knowledge uh, of, it's like the better, the better place, the promised land where everything is good, everything is prosperous and all problems are solved. And um, there is, I have to say, still very little knowledge of what does it mean in the institutional terms, what does it mean in the terms of interest and how different countries have to correlate and work together. So this is still a challenge for both European Union and Ukraine to get more about each other, for European countries to get know more, to get to know more about Ukraine about people, first of all, not only about authorities, but also for Ukrainians to know more about European Union and what is awaiting us somewhere in Brussels. Okay, great, thank you. With that remark, and, and exactly 15 minutes after our end time, I think we reached the end of our Hangouts, and I would like to thank all three panelists, Katya, Jonas and Tom for their contributions. I think it was very interesting. We had some very interesting insights, and uh, and that was, was certainly important for us to inform our internal Jeff political discussion on um, the Eastern Partnership and the future of EU-Ukraine relations. So thank you very much again, and thank you for, for tuning in and uh, listening mm -hmm. and asking questions. Thank and you. thank you for asking questions. <laughs> thank you all. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.